Hey everyone, back again. Today I'm going to talk about Jacques Derrida's notion of the pharmacon and how he develops it in dissemination. Now before jumping into that, if you want to follow me anywhere than here, you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy or on Twitter at David Guineo, uh, where I sometimes tweet things. If you're new here, welcome. I'm David. I try to explain philosophical texts and ideas in a way to make them accessible to you. So if you're new, like, share, subscribe. I release videos every week, sometimes twice a week. And if you want to you know, keep up with that, subscribing is obviously the best way to do it. If you want to help me out, do all those things. You can also help me out via Patreon or PayPal, but obviously no pressure. Links for all that is in the description. And if you found this in podcast form, you're going to be able to find it pretty much anywhere where you get uh, or if, if you found this in podcast form, you're going to be able to find it on YouTube where you'll find the video and other videos if you want. Or if you found this on YouTube, you're going to be able to find it in podcast form pretty much anywhere where you get podcasts. So without further ado, let's jump into this very tricky idea called the Pharmacon. Now, this video is kind of in conjunction with the video coming out on th this Saturday, which is covering the second chapter of Dissemination which is where Derrida covers Plato's pharmacy. Now he uses this text of Plato's to argue that writing occupies a kind of double position in the history of philosophy. It exists as both an inside component of the pursuit of truth and something exterior to it, which is just one way of saying that it can be either part of the system of philosophy arriving towards truth in the platonic sense or it exists outside of it now derrida says that this is the case because when plato talks about writing he uses a term called pharmacon and pharmacon refers to either a remedy or a poison or a cure or a poison very much like how we would understand the term drug today Drug in certain contexts can mean a bad thing, and in other contexts it can mean uh, a good thing, it can mean a cure, it can mean a remedy. But why does this matter? Why is he talking about writing? Why is he talking about it being inside the pursuit of truth and outside the pursuit of truth? Well, he's responding to some ideas out there, uh, before he was writing this, that Plato admonished, or that Plato hated writing that Plato believed that writing was a kind of dead language. That is, when you write something down and somebody reads it, you are not permitting that person to have uh, to respond on the spot to what they are reading. They just have to accept what is being said. Now, people have interpreted this within Plato to say that for Plato, which conditioned much of philosophy that would come afterwards all the way up through Hegel, who's another one of Derrida's targets here. The idea was that you must be in a kind of dialogic encounter in the way that Derrida uses it, a dialectic encounter in order to arrive at truth, in order to move through thought to arrive at some kind of truth. And that can only happen with the presence of another in uh, a kind of immediate presence. They have to be right in front of you. You have to be conversing with them. You have to be engaging with them to arrive at this point. Now, these interpretations of Plato suggested that speech is the only real way to arrive at truth in terms of language, whereas writing, because it doesn't permit a response, is not going to actually get us there. Now, Derrida hears these interpretations, and he's looking at the original Greek, and he says, this is kind of weird, because I'm not interpreting it this way. In fact, I read in Plato not a criticism of writing, but rather, in some, to some extent, a defense of writing. But how can that be? Well, he picks up specifically, or looks at specifically, and so do these other uh, interpretations of Plato, looks at the Phaedrus, which is one of Plato's texts that features a dialogue between Phaedrus and Socrates. Now, to put it really simply, what this uh, dialogue uh, kind of involves is Socrates and Phaedrus leaving the city to go out into the meadow near a little river I think and under under like a tree in order to talk about love and what love means and so they arrive and Phaedrus is standing there and he, he's wearing his cloak and Socrates notices that he's reading uh, essentially reciting someone else's text the text of Lysias in order to 
level his argument, in order to put forward his argument. So Socrates calls him out and says that you aren't actually uh, giving us truth here, you are just re reciting something. So we aren't going to be able to get anywhere with this conversation, therefore foreclosing our pursuit of truth. And as a response, Socrates delivers to Phaedrus an Egypt, a story about from Egyptian mythology where um, to illustrate how writing is something that can be quite bad in that it's going to hinder one's faculties to arrive at truth in the platonic sense and people are just going to give themselves over to memorization. So this story goes like this. Now we're kind of a frame narrative here, we're a story within a story, but Socrates, Socrates tells the story of the demigod Tote and the sun god, or the god of Egypt, Tamus. Now one day, the demigod Tote, who is also the moon god, who happens to also be the god, demigod of math and writing, geometry, goes up to Tamus and is like, hey, Tamus, my boy, if we show the Egyptian people how to write, what that is going to do is it's going to allow them to kind of free their minds from having to think about mundane things. So instead they can write it down. And with that, they'll be able to think about more interesting things. They'll be able to pursue more interesting endeavors in their lives. And Tamus thinks about it for a moment and Tamus says no. And the reason he says no is that he believes if people give themselves over to writing, if they submit to writing their ideas down, instead of it allowing new ideas to emerge, what it is going to produce instead is actually a regression in one's capacity for reason, one's capacity to call upon facts and ideas uh, in, a, in a meaningful way, they are going to essentially become docile even in their own minds. Now in the original, Derrida points out that the term Plato is using throughout all of this is pharmacon, describing writing as a pharmacon. Now in some translations, because this is a difficult term to translate, depending on who is talking, in the case of Tote, the moon god, trying to sell the idea of writing, the translator might translate it as a cure. So Tote says, I have this cure for memory, it's called writing. And then Tamus responds, still talking about the word pharmacon, but instead uses, or it's translated instead to poison. Now in that story that Socrates is telling, obviously he's siding with Tamus. But in the way that it has been translated, it makes it seem that Socrates is therefore siding with the view that writing is only a poison, and that's it. And that's how many people have interpreted, interpreted this text. Now the complexity emerges when we consider how, instead of it being translated to poison or remedy, it is instead translated to both in the term, in terms of pharmacon, or uh, maybe a more accurate translation would just be like drug, that is kind of an ambiguous term in the English speaking world, that reveals or would open up the ambiguity that Plato has about writing, whether he celebrates it or not. Now, what is the point of this? Why does it matter how it's being interpreted? Well, Derrida extracts from this a more general disdain in the history of philosophy for writing as being only a supplement to speech, which is the way to arrive really at truth. Now, Derrida says that, in fact, it doesn't seem as though that's even what Plato is saying. It seems as though instead that Plato actually likes writing if it is conducted in a certain way. So one of the examples that he gives is how Socrates describes truth being written onto the soul, and it is the pursuit of wisdom, the pursuit of knowledge, that tries to read that truth that's written onto all of our souls, which is just another kind of writing. Moreover, the fact that Socrates lays out this Egyptian myth story is essentially a kind of reading and writing uh, and just reciting. All it is, is Socrates using uh, a story that he most likely read, maybe even heard, and all he is doing is reciting this kind of dead speech in order to arrive at a truth about writing. So Derrida says, look, writing houses this potential. Writing is 
an avenue to arrive at truth. And it seems kind of arbitrary and it seems a little bit strange that writing has been so subordinated to speech throughout the history of philosophy because in its original form, at least how it was originally interpreted in Plato, we don't see that kind of condemnation quite so clearly. So what are the stakes? Why does this matter? Well, it matters because it demonstrates that all speech, all arriving at truth, is really just a kind of writing. It's, it's, all it really is, is an extension of the very logic of writing. Now, this isn't to say that Derrida is trying to elevate writing above speech. In fact, what he is trying to do here is showing that the way that writing has been characterized in the history of philosophy as being a kind of dead language, as being exterior to truth, as being only a supplement, is actually the way we can understand speech in, in all its forms because it is just another kind of writing. So here we are, I guess we can look at that very famous sentence in Derrida. The, the sentence goes along the lines of, uh, there's nothing outside of the text. So what Derrida means by this is not that everything is textual. That, that is, everything can be reduced to a kind of textuality. So if we somehow knew how to understand texts, we could then understand the world because everything is just text. Derrida doesn't make that point. Instead, Derrida is saying that all of the attributes that have been associated with writing, like I just said, as a supplement, as exterior, as uh, dead, really apply to speech as well. So in that way, everything corresponds to that. Everything is exterior to itself. Everything is exterior to its own meaning in terms of difference, which is a, maybe a loaded term to introduce here. But for those that know, those that know, uh, everything is kind of a, a deferral from its own self, defined only and de determined by other things around it. No word spoken houses uh, unquestionable truth. It only makes sense within a certain uh, context, a certain linguistic context that is going to relate to other words that have their own existence within that context. And so the meaning of any word is going to be deferred onto other words and how it relates to those words and how it is not those words. So writing now, embodying many of the elements that are now found or demonstrated to be uh, among both speech and writing, this demonstrates really I think Derrida is saying Plato's brilliance here in playing with writing as being a drug, uh, being a cure or a poison. Writing and the way that it would be framed throughout the history of philosophy after Plato kind of occupies both spheres. It, it oscillates between the two, it plays with the two. And in fact, it is only by its designation as being subordinate, a kind of arbitrary signification imposed upon it, that it is given all of these characteristics as being exterior, as being a supplement, as being dead, that actually come to describe the entire experience of that very act of subordinating. That is in how speech is can really be characterized and how Derrida undoes it, which is really what, as I have another video on what deconstruction is, deconstruction is that act of demonstrating how that subordinated term very much embodies many of the elements that are associated primarily with the uh, privilege term, which can then be used to demonstrate the intractability, the um, I, I, maybe a little uh, more accessible term, how the binary is not universal is kind of a, a naive way to put it, but how it is uh, very, very delicate, the binary between two opposing terms, and how the privilege term depends entirely upon the subordinated term as a constructed subordinated term in order to lend itself, that privileged term, its privileged status, even though, as we've shown with speech and writing, it very much is like a pharmacon, can be itself either a poison or a cure. It toes the line between one, uh, the one and the other. And yeah, that I think that that uh, basically covers what a pharmacon is. Like I said, this Saturday, I have an episode coming out on the second chapter of Dissemination where I go into a lot more detail. 
So you can go and check that out if you want more on this. Uh, if you like what I did, like, share, subscribe. If there's anything I got wrong, I'd love to hear about it. Anything that uh, I excluded that I probably shouldn't have, I'd love to hear about it. Uh, if you've listened to this in podcast form where you can leave a review, do that. It helps me out. And yeah. Thanks for listening. Take care.